Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as my time in New Guinea was mentioned, um, let me tell you how totally innocent one was, though you go through. I was in the second best grammar school in Sydney in Australia. Knew absolutely nothing about Aborigines, whether it was the Aborigines of Australia or New Guinea. Um, but I got a job in what was called electrical undertakings department there. And um, when I arrived there, I was taken round the office and introduced to all the other staff members who were all white men, much older than me, and a black guy. So I'm taking round to all the white men who, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, you know, say yes. And they say, oh, this is Bob. And I said, no, Mr. That's Bob. And I said, but, uh, you know, in, in my culture, I call everybody who's older than me, Mr. or Mrs. I can't, you'll do as you're told. You call him by his first name. Um, and I thought, hey, you know, what's going on here? And then um, when I was picked up from the airport, you know, just before I went into the office, I was taken to um, the home of people on long service leave whose house I was going to be able to stay in while something else was found for me. And um, they say, down there, that's where the boy stays. I said, who? Oh, the boy, that's the boy, that's where he stays. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Whose boy? Ah, well, yes, you knew. That's your servant. I said, I don't want any servants. Well, he's the boy for the family that usually stay here, so you'd better take him on. So I said, you know, what can you do? You're a 20-year-old total innocent. Um, so my boss leaves me and this young man comes up and introduces himself in very good English. And we talk about, you know, what I need having done and you know, I don't need having anything done. But I said, well, you know, if you'll help me go shopping because I don't know where to go and what to buy and, and I want to learn to cook, eat local food, you can help me with that. And I ask him how much he's paid, you know, so I can pay him. And I don't remember what it is, but, you know, tuppence a day kind of thing. And I said, no, I, I can't do that. You know, you've got to be paid reasonably, even if you're doing less for me. But, you know, so I agree to whatever I want, think he ought to be paid, given what I am paid. Then when I begin going to work, um, my boss calls me to his office within about a week or so and says, um, what do you think you're doing increasing wages? And I said, well, I beg your pardon? Apparently what had happened was that my boy had told all the other boys in the white compound, which is where we live, that I was increasing his wages enormously by those standards. And now all the other boys were wanting an increase in wages. So you can imagine I, I had many problems. And because I understood nothing about what I was seeing, you know, I didn't know why white people could behave like that or, or their attitudes towards the New Guinea people. Um, I thought when I, I had to go back to Sydney that I would go to university. Um, you know, I, I need to understand what I'm seeing. So I go to Sydney University as a part-time student, I'm working my way through and I'm reading um, psychology and anthropology. And I didn't realize what the university was doing to me, certainly in the anthropology classes, until we have a unit called Primitive Legal Systems, which is about Kano. And I had a friend who was a lawyer, also another Hungarian emigre like me, so I take all my notes to Tommy and say, Tommy, this is a primitive legal system, but it seems uh, very complicated. One is, oh, leave it to me, I'll read through it. <coughs> so when we meet, he says, um, that is a more sophisticated legal system than the one we practice, which of course is the one from England. This is much, much more sophisticated. 
and it sort of blew my mind apart and I thought, and this is called a primitive legal system? You know, and it literally just blew my mind and I thought, well, if I ever get to Nigeria, I have to go to Kano and say thank you so much. And I did do that about 10 years down the road because it's what opened my mind to what had been done to it, right? Um, now, to talk to you about Africa and World War I, I think it's very important really to begin with Africa um, before the arrival of Europeans because that is always wiped out. I mean, Africa just didn't exist before the Europeans went there. And not only because I know about the Kano primitive legal system, but because of all that I have read, I think Africa was at least as sophisticated in every conceivable way as Europe was. It is a huge continent and I believe there was something like a thousand languages spoken in that continent in the 16th century. Now a thousand different languages means a thousand cultures, traditions, legal systems, religions, family traditions, which I think is very, very important. The other thing that I think is important is um, how when Europeans go there, um, you know, they all go and explore this unknown continent. Well, that continent was well known to the people who lived on it because they traded all over it. You know, there are trade routes north, south, east and west. So if I want to go from here to there, all I have to do is talk to somebody who's one of the traders and say, please, you know, I want to go in that direction, <laughs> will you take me up there? And he can then hand me over to the next person if, if his trade stopped there and take me on. Um, so all those explorers should be on their knees saying, thank you so much <laughs> for taking me around Africa. And I think these are so important, you know, because we say, oh, you know, we explored it. Well, because we were led around it. it it's different. It's very, very different. Um, then I think we have to look at the trade in enslaved Africans very differently from how it is looked upon now. Um, yes, there was slavery in Africa before the Europeans arrived there, as there was slavery in Europe. We don't often use the word slave. We use serfs and we use villains but the conditions were pretty similar to what we call slavery in Africa. Um, and in some ways very different because yes, the Arab people were involved in the trade in slaves, but what they wanted was women for the harems, generally speaking, and men for the military. So it's a very different sort of attitude to just having these savages who are only good for digging the soil. Um, but, and I'm telling you that partly because the Europeans could only acquire Africans to transport across the Atlantic by trading with the Africans along the coast. There is absolutely no way that Africans along the coast would know that European attitudes to slavery were very different to their own. And I think that's quite important. Um, now, the next question to me is important question is how did those traders along the coasts acquire Africans to sell to the Europeans? Well, most of the time in, in traditional terms, Anybody who became a prisoner of war could be used as a slave within a family, very often in the end married within the family, but you know, a very different system. But that's how you acquired slaves, through prisoners of war. That means that this trade in enslaved Africans by the Europeans fostered wars. And of course, what they would do is I would go to you and say, well, 
he's got guns from the Portuguese, so he's going to attack you. So I'll sell you some guns to make sure you can defend yourself, and that will help you to produce some slaves as well. So we, I think, introduce guns for this reason and foster the wars. And where people didn't fight wars, they weren't kidnapping. Um, and I have visited some of the sites in, in northern Ghana related to this, um, which people still talk about, and it, it's, it just breaks your heart. Um, we don't know how many Africans were killed in these wars. Of course, the wars weren't about killing, but people do get killed in wars. And then if you are fighting the war 400 miles from the coast, that's a long bloody walk to the coast. And we don't know how many people might have died in those marches. And having been into the slave trade castles along the Ghana coast, I wonder how many people died in those castles because you go to where the men were held and, and as the rooms were filling up, you wouldn't have had more space than on that drawing that we have of that slave ship. And there was a gutter along the wall that you used as your toilet um, and there's one window. The heat must have killed many people, as well as the lack of enough water and perhaps the wrong kind of food. And just being squashed into that tiny space in that heat, you know. Um, so we don't know how many people died in that process. Then the Europeans stopped trading in slaves. Um, because they've got quite enough in, across the Atlantic to do all that they want done. Um, well, that's my idea of why they stopped trading. Um, but Africa has all these mineral resources, as well as some very fertile land. Now, Europeans don't want to fight each other to acquire that land. So they get together in Berlin in 1885 and sit around a table with a map of Africa deciding who is going to own what. And no, you can't own that and that because those are both gold producing areas so you can have that bit of gold and I'll have this bit of gold and you have that, no, 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 you know, we've got to share that as well. So they discuss and discuss to make sure that they will not be fighting each other in order to have access to what they want, the minerals and the land. Which of course means that the boundaries of the empires, the kingdoms, the dukedoms, the duchies, the smaller groups of people is completely ignored. Completely ignored. And I think that is there today and that you squeeze people together and say, you are now Nigerians and you are Ghanaians and you are um, Ivory Coast people and you are Kenyans. Didn't mean anything to most people. They weren't. You know, they weren't. Um, I'll give you a wonderful example that, of what that means today. Um, I'm involved in trying to help some schools in, in northeast Ghana and I'm in a village up in the northeast and um, one reason I'm there is because the central government has announced that it's going to send out English teachers to the adults because the language used in schools is English but there were no schools when the adults were children so the adults don't understand so they have to speak English, right? Um, and I think, well, yes, that good idea, I think, really. But then people tell me that there's no teachers to be seen anywhere. So when I'm up there really involved in the school, um, they gather a meeting together because they hear that I'm interested in finding out, are there in fact any teachers of English that have come up to work with the adults? So there's a discussion going on. <coughs> 
and then somebody stands up and shouts. And um, the person who organized the meeting, who was the head teacher, who spoke good English, um, is translating everything for me. And then he's quiet for a minute when this woman had stood up and shouted. And then he says, well, what she's saying is that we heard that the government was sending someone out to teach us ever. Who on earth up here wants to speak ever? Ever is one of the southern languages, <laughs> which demonstrates, you know, what I said, what does it mean to be a Ghanaian? It's very, very difficult, I think, to create a nation out of these boundaries and given that history and then the forms of what I think are neo-colonialism. Um, right, now, so that's where I think you have to begin when you're teaching World War I, because you're teaching World War I in Africa, but Africa doesn't mean much to many people in this country. It's, you know, some continent over there that we had to Christianize and civilize because they were all savages. And that attitude is, was perpetrated and to, to some extent it still is. Right, now, um, Germany had four colonies in, in Africa, as you've been told. Um, what you weren't told is that Germany had an enormous volume of trade with the British colonies. Um, it was the main um, exporter to Sierra Leone, 50% of um, the trade with Ghana, sorry, the Gold Coast. I don't know how much Germany traded with the French colonies, but if they did with the English, it would have been with the French as well. So that taking the colonies away from Germany was not just about saying, well, that's going to be mine now. It was also stopping this trade, which of course was hurting the British traders who wanted to be the main traders, not have the Germans there. So I think the, um, the reason that the war, that the first gunshot in the war was fired I think almost the day before the war officially started was in Togo is kind of quite interesting and I don't know if we will ever have the papers released about about the German um, traders in Togo and how they were involved with the Gold Coast next door and you know there were more reasons to take over Togo. And very interestingly, that first gun was fired um, by somebody from one of the villages that are, or at least one of the small states up in the north of Ghana that I'm <laughs> quite familiar with. Um, and of course, they have been taught this history, not in schools, because, well, there aren't enough school books now. So I think that the wars were, were very complicated and I haven't researched the history of the war except by reading other people's work and had an article published in a UNESCO journal called Information History of the First World War where everybody's questioning who produces what information and for what purposes and what is withheld. So I looked at a lot of people's work and thought, well, we don't know how many carriers there were we don't know how many soldiers there were, we don't know how many died, we don't know how many were paid. Um, so I'm going to read you the questions that I ask at the very end of this chapter. It's about how many were recruited for the military and the carrier corps, how many women were recruited, how many died, how many were permanently disabled, were any of these ever paid? Did the widows of the men who died receive payment? How many women were raped as the soldiers marched backwards and forwards? Then a very long question, and I will read this to you as well. 
how many of the civilian population died due to starvation even before the drought and the arrival of the Spanish flu. One of General Leto Warbeck's, that's the German um, general, doctors reported in September 1918 that behind us we leave destroyed fields and for the immediate future, starvation. We are no longer the agents of culture. Our track is marked by death, plundering and evacuated villages. Historian Tim Stapleton reports that, quote, German and allied armies lived off food produced by the local population. Looting did occur. Germans simply confiscated what they wanted. Britain tended to pay for the grain and livestock they acquired, but there was an underlying element of coercion. It was common to see corpses along the paths. In one village, the people's skulls littered the ground like coconuts. Then, an official post-war German estimate suggests that around 300,000 civilians had died from starvation attributed to the conflict. Some historians estimate that a million died in East Africa, a result of the war. Right? And my final question is, what was the long-term effect of this depopulation and devastation, especially in German East Africa? What I don't ask there and don't mention there is that, of course, South Africa took over what today is now Namibia and held on to Namibia and murdered, I have no idea how many hundreds of thousands of people from Namibia until Namibia obtained independence from South Africa, which acquired that country on behalf of Britain in World War I. Of course, the other thing, um, I think now there is some research trying to be done on what was it like for the men when they went home, the men and perhaps women? Um, you know, what did they take back with them? What did that experience do to them psychologically as, as well as, as politically? Because it had to, it had to. Because the other, in a way, interesting thing to me is given that, you know, Africa is Africa, but I mentioned to you the possibility of a thousand languages. The people in the King's African relig um, regiments, how many languages did they speak? The Royal West Africa Frontier Force, how many languages they did speak? How could they communicate with each other? Um, how well did um, the officers manage to communicate with them? And mentioning officers, I think it's very, very important to say that, of course, of course, underlined and in bright red letters, all the officers were whites. Um, nobody else could, um, could take on those jobs, not these savages. They had to be officered by whites. And the white officers could have four carriers, that is their own personal servants, to carry everything for them, which tells you something about distinctions. Um, and I, I don't know if there is any research on how well educated or miseducated these officers were before they were assigned to, to African, African troops. Um, uh, perhaps the final thing important to mention is that the French did, perform, did permit um, a dark-skinned man to point a gun at a European and they did use African troops in Europe. Britain didn't do that at all. Britain felt that it would be too dangerous to <laughs> allow its colonial subjects to point a gun at a white man. So even if you were in, for example, the British West India Regiment, trained as military, brought to Europe, 
you were used as labor corps 90% of the time. So not surprisingly, there was they caused a few problems. They didn't expect to be treated as carriers when they were trained professional soldiers. Um, how the West Africans, the British West Africans felt once they learned that the French did permit them to, to fight in Europe, you know, I don't know. Because um, people talk to each other because those boundaries are, don't divide people who speak, I mean, divide people who speak the same languages. So the information must have been passed on. And I think that's, I think I've talked for quite long enough. Thank you. Thank you very much.